Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff, and it is New Server Day. Now, I know most people know me as a home lab YouTuber, one of the crazy ones that has a full rack out in my garage. In my server rack, I have hundreds of terabytes of storage, 100 gig networking, virtual machine hosts, GPU servers, but most of my equipment has something in common. Basically, all of the gear that I've acquired over the years was bought used, which is why it's so incredibly satisfying to see this box sitting in the middle of it all. This is Intel's Granite Rapids test kit. It's a review server, so industry folks can run the new Xeon 6900P CPUs through their paces. And this one is mine. By the way, thank you to Intel for sending this over for me to take a look at. On this channel, I've reviewed new server platforms before, but it's rare that I get my hands on the latest flagship enterprise parts. Inside this box are a pair of Intel Xeon 6980p CPUs based on Intel's brand new Granite Rapids architecture. Each CPU has 128 cores, 256 threads, and 12 channels of DDR5 support, meaning this server has 256 cores, 512 threads, and a full 1.5 terabytes of DDR5-6400 registered ECC spread across 24 64 gigabyte sticks. If you want a full breakdown of this new CPU architecture, I will leave my previous video right up here, as I had the opportunity to visit Intel's campus and chat with them about the new chips about a month and a half ago. But this all begs the question, where does one even start when benchmarking or reviewing a system like this? While they are insanely powerful, systems with this many cores aren't typically set to running just a single task. And I don't really want to base my opinion around these servers based around how fast can it decompress a 7-zip file, or how long does it take to recompile the Linux kernel. I've been thinking of ways to demonstrate real-world use cases, such as creating a couple hundred virtual machines, or running multiple tasks in parallel. But in the end, I think I've come up with the perfect solution. Like I mentioned in the original Granite Rapids video, basically every tech company today is 110% in on AI. And it's hard to blame them, as literal nuclear reactors are starting to spin back up to power the demand for AI processing. The entire presentation from Intel during the Granite Rapids launch event was focused around using Granite Rapids for AI, whether in CPU-centric tasks or as a GPU interconnect. And therein lies some of the problem. AI tasks today are almost entirely built around GPU or ASIC compute. Traditional CPU HPC is just not as competitive in the AI landscape, unless it's being used as a platform to simply plug other accelerators into. As such, I'm not really interested in showing off CPU-centric AI tasks to an audience that probably wouldn't be receptive to it anyway. But feel free to let me know if I'm off base down in the comments below. My audience is much more interested in hosting solutions, generalized compute, distributed computing, and it's a market that's being almost completely ignored in exchange for LLMs and generative AI. Even on hardware like this, that would be much better served by simply stacking a bunch of GPUs inside of it. Now don't get me wrong, today we're going to make this system go burr, because that's exactly what a lot of you want to see. But those are all going to be synthetic tests, and will only give peak raw performance metrics. As Intel themselves stated, most cloud hosting servers spend their days sitting between 30 and 60% utilization, hosting hundreds of smaller services. So how does one go about simulating that use case to properly review a distributed compute server like this? Well, I'm going to put the server into a colo, or colocation host, and allow my Patreon supporters to install their own services onto it via OpenStack. This will take most of the control away from me as a test administrator, but will lend itself to being an actual real-world example of a cloud hosting server in deployment. I'm still working out all the details on how this is actually going to work, and I still need to get a storage partner on board. By the way, Solidime, if you're listening, give me a ring. But I also feel that putting a server into deployment and actually watching it work might be the best way to test out if Intel's newest architecture is truly a step in the right direction for them, especially from the perspective of a cloud hosting provider. And by the way, I'm also working with AMD on a very similar test as soon as I get my Turin CPUs in hand. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of those projects. Also, join the Patreon where you might get virtualized access to both of these machines. But there's a sticking point when it comes to publishing performance numbers for a flagship enterprise CPU like this. I have zero points of reference for competing platforms or last generation products right now. I do have a single Sapphire Rapids and a single Emerald Rapids CPU from Intel's previous two CPU releases, but I don't have a motherboard for them. I do have quite a few AMD Epic Naples and Epic Rome CPUs, but only single CPU motherboards for those, and this is a dual processor system. 
I do have an AMD Genoa 9554 64 core CPU up and running in my rack. But again, that board is only a single CPU socket, and that particular motherboard only supports eight channels of DDR5. So we'd be hampering that CPU in the test anyway. So essentially, I have this 256 core Intel Granite Rapids test rig, but nothing to directly compare it to. So I figured for today, it might be fun to compare Granite Rapids to a platform that a lot of you know quite well, especially those that have watched my channel over the years. Today, we're gonna to compare Intel's top CPU platform from 2024 against the top Intel CPU platforms from 2016 and 2017, that being Broadwell and Skylake. Is it a stupid comparison? Yeah, maybe, but when you start reviewing modern platforms, you have to start somewhere. But this comparison may also not be as stupid as it seems on its face. Finding seven and eight year old servers in deployment actually isn't that rare in the small and medium business space, as not every business can afford to refresh servers every three to five years. Outside of HPC and enterprise, five to seven year deployments are far more normal than most people would like to admit. For Broadwell, I've got an ASUS ESC 4000 G3 server with a pair of Intel Xeon E5 2697 V4 CPUs. While these are not quite the top 22 core SKUs offered by Intel in the E5 2699 V4, these still feature a full 18 cores and 36 threads each, along with four channels of DDR4 2400 memory. For the Skylake chips, we're looking at an HP DL380 Gen 10 and a pair of Xeon Platinum 8160 CPUs. Just like the other server, the 8160s are just a half step behind the top rated SKU offered by Intel of that generation. Instead of 28 cores, these are rocking 24 cores and 48 threads each. We'll also only be using four memory channels per CPU instead of the six supported, as that's what I had access to for this testing. By the way, huge shout out to the Fat Hacker and Yakto over on my Patreon for providing access to this particular server. So we've got a modern 256 core server with 24 channels of memory, going up against a 36 core and 48 core server from seven years ago. If you were expecting any of these tests to be close, you're about to be disappointed. The results are an absolute bloodbath, even in tests that can't fully utilize all 512 threads from Granite Rapids. Starting with C-Ray, a CPU-based ray tracing simulation, quite similar to Cinebench, we're testing multi-threaded performance in three different resolutions. The 2697 V4 gets us started, completing the 1080p render in 33 seconds, the 4K scene in 131 seconds, and needed 232 seconds to scale up to 5K. Bumping up just one generation to Skylight gives us around 30% more performance, though that's much less impressive when you consider there are also 30% more cores compared to Broadwell. But architecturally, there's little difference between Broadwell and Skylight, so this isn't exactly unexpected. Bumping up to Granite Rapids, there may be seven times as many CPU cores, but the results are closer to 11 times faster, completing the 1080p render in just 2.9 seconds. In fact, even the 5K render completed in half the time it took for Broadwell to complete the 1080p test. Taking a look at Pharonix's Linux compile benchmark, we get some respectable marks from both the Broadwell and Skylake Xeons, completing the test in 67 and 60 seconds respectively. Here, Granite Rapids is only 2.5 times faster, finishing the compile in just 27 seconds. This is actually a test I'd like to see split out to a bunch of different virtual machines to see just how high performance can actually scale with multiple workloads, as we're obviously not using all of the hardware that's on offer here. Jumping over to Y-Cruncher, the Pi Calculator gave us some interesting results, but not from the Granite Rapids chips. Just looking at the 500 million calculation, the 2697 V4s manage a score of 10.34 seconds, which actually beats the score of 13.29 seconds from the Xeon 8160s. And that performance disparity carries through every test, all the way up through the 25 billion calculation. In fact, when reviewing the numbers, I thought I had mixed up the two CPU charts. So I went back and retested the Broadwell chips and came up with the exact same results. Both the Xeon 2697 V4s and the 8160s were set to high performance scaling in Linux, which basically lets them draw as much power as they need. Still, the Skylake chips managed to fall behind the older generation Broadwell CPUs by about 30%. And that's all to say that the Xeon 6980P CPUs absolutely decimated both systems, managing the 500 million run in just 1.55 seconds, nearly seven times faster than the 2697 V4s. And the longer that each test ran, the bigger that gap became. 
At 1 billion digits, we see a 7.9x increase. At 5 billion and up, the gap widens to 9.5x, again outpacing individual core count increases, proving better overall per core performance as well. And finally, I wanted to demonstrate a more practical benchmark in OpenSSL. If you host encryption services like web hosting or encrypted file storage, these are results that should matter most to you. In SHA-256 encryption, we see some seemingly impressive results from both the Broadwell and Skylake Xeons at around 8.3 and 10.7 gigabytes per second. But just how much faster is the Granite Rapids Xeon system? Are we scaling up with core count and hitting 80 gigabytes per second? How about the 12 to 14 times improvement like we saw in C-Ray and going for 110 gigabytes per second? No, the result is far more impressive. See, Xeon 6 CPUs, that is both Sierra Forest and Granite Rapids, have accelerators built into the I.O. tile to assist with tasks like encryption and decryption, compression and decompression, offloading specific instructions to purpose-built silicon to increase overall performance. So here, with SHA-256 encryption, the pair of 6980p CPUs are actually capable of over 300 gigabytes per second, a full 36 times faster than a pair of 2697v4s. OpenSSL's RSA-4096 test also shows significant gains as well, coming in at 16 times faster in time to sign. Signature verification doesn't appear to take advantage of the accelerators though, coming in at just 9 times faster, relying on CPU core count and general performance uplifts. While this is far from a comprehensive benchmark list, I don't think there's a shortage of comparables available from sites like Serve the Home, Storage Review, Pharonix, and the like, and I hope to be included in a pretty prestigious list like that one of these days. But it's not often you get to see brand new flagship servers going toe-to-toe -to -toe with generations old systems, and I think it demonstrates just how much more performance is available at scale than there was just a short while ago. But just based on a couple of the benchmarks that I have here, think about servers that you have in deployment and the server rack space that you're utilizing. Let's say you have a generalized cloud hosting server and you're taking up 36U of rack space for 18 different servers. Those 18 different servers can be compressed into a 4U rack space with two 2U servers running these processors to replace every single Broadwell system in that server stack. And that's just generalized compute, where we're talking about a 9 to 1 performance advantage for Granite Rapids over Broadwell. If you have something like encryption, where you can take advantage of the accelerators inside of here, we're talking about upwards of a 36 to 1 ratio as far as performance density goes with these new servers. And that's absolutely insane. But again, I am far from done testing on this hardware. For starters, a large number of benchmarks just don't scale up to 512 threads all that well at this point. And that's just looking at CPU-only workloads running basic instructions. I ran a couple tests that showed little or even no improvement over Broadwell Xeons simply because the benchmark either can't scale up to that many individual threads, or there was a resource bottleneck elsewhere in the system. Remember, this might have 256 cores and 1.5 terabyte of memory, but that's all running off a single 1 terabyte NVMe drive. I do have a pair of 8 terabyte NVMe drives in here, but none of the tests that I wanted to run relied on storage bandwidth. At least not yet. It's important to remember that, in contrast to looking at consumer hardware reviews, for example, raw speed is far from the only equation when looking at overall system performance. With other factors like storage architecture and availability, memory speed and allocation, hell, even the version of software that you're running. The fact is, as fast as these CPUs are, I want to see them actually deployed and working. That means adding a storage pool that can keep up with the CPUs and putting actual workloads onto it. Not just drag racing for Y-Cruncher records. Now, like I said, I'm hoping in the next month to deploy the server to a colo rack and configure it with OpenStack so I can dynamically allocate different chunks of hardware to my Patreon supporters. I want you guys to help me test this system. That is, if you want to run a service in the cloud, if you want a colo server to run something, uh, we want to load this thing up as much as we can and then see how individual services perform. That way we can get an actual good idea of cloud hosting performance without just trying to simulate it all. Just like I've mentioned for my consumer reviews of CPUs and GPUs, while it is absolutely vital information to have drag racing hardware to find out exactly where something fits in a total product stack or how powerful something is, it doesn't give you actual usable information at the end of the day. The only way you can do that is by actually putting a system into deployment or testing with 
use cases that are actually used day in and day out. You often end up with different metrics. You also end up with often different strengths and weaknesses that regular testing just would not identify. So I am excited to get this thing up and deployed and let some of you start tinkering with it. It's definitely going to be an interesting journey getting this all worked out as far as how exactly we want to handle this. But I think it's one of the best ways to get some actual real world results from people who want to run services in the cloud and for me to test it as a cloud provider. If you have an idea for services you'd like to see run on this system, feel free to drop those down in the comments below. And if you want access to the system here in the next month, make sure to join the Patreon and get access to my Discord server. Only a dollar a month gets you access to the exclusive Discord where you can chat with myself as well as the other hosts from Talking Heads. And that's gonna do for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. for today is from The Brewing Project out of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. It is Dare Mighty Things IPA, clocking in at 6.1%. All right, The Brewing Project, Dare Mighty Things. Uh, definitely a hazy IPA. Definitely a bright, citrusy, hazy IPA. None of that, that weak, you know, bold fruit, you know, your your oranges and your guava and, and things like that. No, this is this is straight pineapple. This is a pineapple mimosa with brute champagne. It is bright. It is dry. This isn't the right word, but exfoliating. It is tingly. And the thing I love most about it is it is an old school 2015 to 2020 hazy IPA. It has that same amount of huge citrus kick. It feels like you're gonna have this acid burn in the back of your throat, but that just never materializes. It's one of the first hazy IPAs that I've drank that it feels scratchy and bitey, but it, it just doesn't accumulate. It doesn't build into something where this is no longer a pleasant beer. I've had 12 ounces of this beer so far and I want more. And I'm still tasting all the flavors. And I bet I could go drink another beer and taste that beer equally as well. This is that that classic hazy bite without also tasting like you're swallowing glass shards after four ounces. Definitely recommended.